G'day, my name is Mark and just over a year ago I decided to start this YouTube channel to talk about rugby which is a huge passion of mine. Now I'm a retired Kiwi bloke that's living here in beautiful Cancun in Mexico and I thought what's a small way that I can help grow the great game of rugby across the world and I came up with the idea of this channel and just sharing my passion for the game. So if you think that's a worthy cause to support and you enjoy my content, why not hit the subscribe button, come along for the journey and find out more about how you can support my adventure in making videos about the great game of rugby. Now in the past few days I've been making videos about the rugby championship of 2024, going through each of the team's performances as I've seen it and asked you to give your opinions as well. Well, today is the last day in that series and I'm going to be talking about the eventual winners of the Rugby Championship in 2024 and of course that was South Africa. So let's get into that video right now. Now yesterday I received a comment from a viewer who spoke about how they're a little bit upset with me about how I'm always going on about how good South Africa is this year. Well I can tell that person and everyone else watching I'm always going to share my opinion here on my channel and if you don't like it well that's great because I expect to hear your opinion as well but you're not going to change mine and if I think a rugby team's playing well I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to tell you about it on a consistent basis. I did that for many years when the All Blacks were dominant and now we have a different team at the top of the tree for a while and that's perfectly okay as far as I'm concerned. So let's enjoy how well South African are playing at the moment and let's hope that some other teams can get up there and knock them off their perch in the not too distant future. Now talking about the Rugby Championship in 2024, South Africa came out on top and in this video I'm going to talk about some of the things that I noticed particularly around some players, some things that Rassi did and of course looking forward and if you want to look at my video tomorrow coming up it may be a little bit controversial for some because I'm having a look at the depth in South African rugby and how I think that may not be important as we go forward towards the next Rugby World Cup so make sure you check that out tomorrow on my channel Inside Rugby with Mark. Now South Africa started off their campaign in the Rugby Championship this year against Australia in Australia and it was a really interesting start to the Rugby Championship for me because South Africa had played those two test matches against Ireland. They were beaten by one point in the second test match. Then they had a game against Portugal which was very entertaining and then they went to Brisbane to take on the Australian Wallabies at Suncorp Stadium and it was really going to be an interesting start to the series because South Africa had not typically done very well in Brisbane before. As we all know though, the Australian Wallabies were rebuilding under Joe Schmidt and a lot of people expected that South Africa were going to do this and have a comfortable win, which in the end they did. Now I thought Australia put up a good fight in the first 20 minutes of that game, but, I, but South Africa's talent, depth and experience really paid off as they went through and really had a healthy win in that first game in Brisbane. So it was going to be interesting to see what happened in Perth when the second game of that series got underway at Optus Stadium. Unfortunately the Western Australian weather didn't do us any favours, it was atrocious conditions for both teams and it ended up being a bit of an arm wrestle and a grind out for South Africa. But when they were able to put good plays together in those conditions they came out well on top. But Australia did improve, instead of the 7 points they scored in the first game they scored 12 points in the second game. And there was a little bit of a glimmer of hope that this Australian team was going to slowly build. But what we were seeing from South Africa was the typical South African precision that we've got to know of them in recent times. Now I buy into the notion that this Springboks team is a very special team, there's no doubt about it. But I also buy into the notion that they're not far away from being beaten on a regular basis. And I say that because if we go back to the Rugby World Cup last year in France, in particular the knockout stage of that tournament, we all know that those games that South Africa played against France, England and New Zealand were very very close and they were within one score of potentially losing those games. Then we saw Ireland beat South Africa in South Africa this year and it was another indication that other top teams in world rugby can really take South Africa down. So I was looking immensely forward to the All Blacks campaign in South Africa this year. I knew it was going to be tough for the All Blacks because they're rebuilding under uh, Scott Robertson 
They hadn't been looking very good up until that stage. They were, of course, beaten in Ar by Argentina in Wellington. And I'm sure that didn't give them the kind of belief that they were looking for as they headed off to Alice Park in Johannesburg to take on South Africa in that first test. Now for me, one of the biggest things in rugby and watching rugby around the world is an All Black South Africa test match at Alice Park. And boy, what a build up there was to that game. And what a game it was as well as the two teams crunched and bunched each other throughout the 80 minutes and South Africa just coming out on top again. But again, that winning ethos was something that we're starting to see from South Africa. They know how to win games. And that is a really potential difficult formula to crack because it gives teams a lot of self-belief, a lot of momentum, and particularly against the best teams in the world. If they've done it before, then they believe they can do it again. And that's exactly what we saw in that first game in Johannesburg. Now, by the time we'd got to this stage of the rugby championship, we'd seen Rassi make quite a lot of changes throughout the squad. And he's made it no secret that over the course of the next couple of years, he wants to build more than 50 players that are capable of interchanging into positions and are going to be good enough for South Africa to win the next Rugby World Cup in Australia in 2027. And it's that rotation basis that's made some of you upset because it's been disrespected in some faces. But in others like me, it's been an absolute genius stroke because it's given the ability for different players to come on and show what they've got. And I guess after that Johannesburg test, for people like me who are in neutral in respect to South African rugby and haven't watched a lot of domestic rugby or people like Sasha Feinberg and Goma Zulu growing up and watching him come up through the ranks to actually see him on the world stage against the mighty All Blacks was wonderful to see the talent that's in the squad for the Springboks. So for me, that first test against the All Blacks was a great one to see the talent that's on display with South Africa. But also, it was another opportunity to relish the genius and the experience of pe people like Sia Kalesi and Peter Steff de Toy. Out of those two players, I think it's Peter Steff de Toy that obviously gets a lot of kudos from the media and from fans alike. But I tell you what, when Sia Kalesi retires one day, you Springboks fans are going to really miss him because his play on the field is also just as important as all the ambassadorship and everything he does off the field. He's a fantastic leader and I think this year in particular as I've watched South Africa's campaign throughout the rugby championship, Sia Kalesi has been playing outstanding rugby and uh, that's going to be another big hole for South Africa to have to replace when the time comes for Kalesi to retire. Now one of the other things I noticed as we were watching the Rugby Championship up until this stage was the importance of Damien Diolandi and Jesse Creel to the centres of the South African team. They're absolutely brilliant together. Of course they're a historic pairing that's played a lot of test matches together and whether it be an offence or defence, Jesse Creel and Damien Diolandi bring two different dynamics to that inside centre pairing. Diolandi's a huge guy, he busts the line but he's also big on tackles and stopping the opposition from getting through and making line breaks. And we saw that early in the South African campaign, whether it be against Australia or also against New Zealand. Jesse Creel, on the other hand, is that link guy, isn't he? He makes sure that either Cheslin Colby, Makazolo Mapimpi, or Kurtley Ardenser are actually getting opportunities to break down the field and setting them up nicely. And when we do see the fullback coming into play, whether it be Fassi or Willie LaRue, we also see Jesse Creel playing a very important part in that role for South Africa. We've also seen him do some very good try saving tackles in that role in 13. So I think as far as the centre pairings in world rugby go at the moment, for me, Damien Diolandi and Jesse Creel are probably at the top of the tree. And while we're talking about the uh, outside backs and the backs in particular for South Africa, haven't they got a wealth of talent out there? And I think this whole notion of what Tony Brown's trying to bring to the Springboks team is to help them play this wider, expansive game that has been built on the dominance of the forwards. And I think that's a key thing to remember. It's not that uh, I think Tony Brown and Rassi are trying to turn the Springboks team into a Fiji-style rugby team. Not at all. I think they want to be able to complement what their forwards are able to do and achieve up front, whether it be in the set-piece play or whether it be in the breakdown opportunities. And we saw that again throughout the rugby championship. And as we went on to Cape Town to the DHL stadium to see that second test match against the All Blacks, it was again 
that type of play that we saw from the Springboks that was really impressive for me. We not only saw them going hard in the forwards where I thought the All Black forwards played better in that second game but South Africa was still able to match them and give them a hard time but it was the South African backline that was able to use that ball in a constructive and a more creative manner than perhaps what we've seen them in the past and that was one of the things that I was really enjoying from the South African team throughout this year's rugby championship. By the time we got to that second game in Cape Town, I thought that uh, Fassi at fullback had really started to cement himself in that position. He'd showed that he was really good under the high ball for those people who didn't know that Fassi was very competent when it comes to taking high balls. But it was this counter attacking for me that was exceptional. He was able to break through the lines of defences and really create opportunities for the South African team to go forward. And when you've got people like Quagga Smith and Peter Steph de Toy who run off these guys when they have a break, it makes it very difficult for defences to line up and to stop the South Africans from going forward. So I think that's been another thing that's been very, very prevalent for me throughout this year's rugby championship. So it was another win for South Africa in the Cape Town over the All Blacks and they would have been very thrilled in having a 2-0 series against the All Blacks at home. But it just showed also that the All Blacks weren't too far away and that was one of the things that probably concerned me a little bit with the South African team. They're an exceptionally good team this year and with an All Black team that's not quite there hitting their straps at the moment and only one score away from the Springboks, I think that leads to a very exciting future between these two teams as we get closer and closer to the next Rugby World Cup. So as the Springboks headed to Argentina for round five of this year's rugby championship, it was another opportunity for Rassi to rotate the squad a little bit. So as the selections came out for that game, we saw the likes of Manny Lebok getting an opportunity, Vandenberg coming in at halfback, we saw Mapimpi on the wing, and we saw the likes of Salman Morat coming in to the locking position. A lot of you had shared your thoughts about Morat on this channel before. Well, what a game it was we had in Santiago del Esteria. It was a fantastic game and Argentina hit the lead with 10 minutes to go and they held on to the end. And of course there was all that controversy unwarranted around Manny Leboc missing that final penalty kick. Manny did some really good things in that game which I've spoken about in previous videos. And I'm still a fan of Manny Leboc. I think from right back to the Rugby World Cup last year where I saw him do some really good things for South Africa. I think he's got the talent that is required in the South African team. So Argentina got over top of South Africa in that game by one point. So of course that was going to install a backlash in South Africa. And we saw Rassi change the team again, of course, for the final game in this year's rugby championship that was played at the Mombella Stadium in Neil Spratt. And I was looking forward to this game because we all knew what was coming. We all knew that South Africa were gonna throw everything at this Argentinian team. And a little bit like what happened when Argentina beat New Zealand in Wellington. The All Blacks came back a week later and absolutely gave it everything in that game at Eden Park. Well, we saw exactly the same thing, didn't we, in the Mombella Stadium. We saw the likes of Bonami and Oxen cheer, and also Franz Maherba put on a fantastic performance in that front row, shoring up the scrum again and putting on a lot of pressure. We saw great performances, of course, from Eben Etzebeth, who was celebrating his 128th cap for the Springboks and that was a huge milestone throughout this rugby championship. He became the all-time cap player for the Springboks and what a momentous player he is for the country. So it was absolutely rewarding that on that particular stage at the Mombella Stadium that Etzebeth got to share that along with his adoring fans in South Africa and for me that was one of the moments of this year's rugby championship. Ruan Norkia, I thought, has been playing very well when selected for South Africa. He's getting better and better. And I think he's got a really good pairing with Etzebeth. They have an understanding there in that locking duo. And he got some good line-out ball when he played in the games for South Africa. But it's the loose trio that we talk about a lot for the Springboks team. And that man in particular, Peter Steph de Toy, who had another fantastic rugby championship. He's definitely up there with one of the best players in the world. I don't think it's important to label these guys as the best player in the world. I think we've got a group of players that are super talented in the world of rugby. They do different things on different days and we should embrace that and celebrate that as rugby fans. But yes, there's no doubt about it. Peter Steph de Toy, in my opinion, 
is one of the best players in world rugby at the moment and he showed it once again he's just so versatile he's brilliant in the lineouts he puts his weight in in the scrums he's up in general play you find him out on the wing taking balls and heading off to score tries and he's absolutely huge in the breakdowns all the time for the Springboks. so if you wanted to mold the perfect forward in world rugby i think peter steph the toy would be the mold that you'd use one of the other things I was really impressed throughout the rugby championship was the leadership of Sia Kolesi and also his play. Playing against or with Peter Steff de Toy on the other flank, sometimes you might be overshadowed by the brilliance of Peter Steff de Toy. But if you watch Sia Kolesi throughout this year's rugby championship, you'll see that not only was his leadership vitally important against the All Blacks, you could see him revving up the team, getting very vocal, getting very emotional. And as an All Black fan, that's something we're missing from our own team at the moment. But Sia Kalesi is that man that goes in there and does that. And those guys want to follow him over the wall and into the trenches. There's no doubt about it. But he's been playing exceptionally good rugby. He was featuring in a lot of general play. He was making some big tackles. I think Sia Kalesi had probably the best rugby championship he's played in so far in his career. And then at number eight, we saw Jasper Visa getting better and better, I thought, throughout the rugby championship. I thought that his discipline was a big issue in a couple of the games. But when he was on song and he made those tackles and those bursting runs, Jasper Visa again showed a neutral like me to South African rugby how good he is and how dynamic he can be at number eight for the Springboks. And Rassi put his faith in him towards the end of the championship. Now the halfback position was interesting for me throughout the rugby championship because we saw Vandenberg, we saw Grant Williams, we saw Corbus Reinhardt. We saw lots of different options being used because Faf de Klerk is out at the moment injured and it's been a great opportunity and no slight on Faf's injury. We of course want to see him back in the Springbok jersey as soon as possible but this gave Rassi an opportunity to put these other players in under the pressure of being the halfback. We saw Jaden Hendricksy as well. And I tell you what, I like Hendricksy what I saw in the last few games. I wasn't a fan of Hendricksy before and that was probably because I hadn't seen him play a lot of test rugby under this pressure. But I saw what he did with Manny Leboc in those couple of last games and I was very impressed with the way that he went about it. His kicking was on point as well. He did some contestable kicks. His distribution was pretty good and when he did decide to run, run from the base of the ruck or the scrum, he was effective in that position. So I can't say many bad things at all about Jaden Hendricksy's performance throughout this year's rugby championship. I'm a big fan of Grant Williams and I can't wait for him to come back from injury because I think he's one of those players that can continue to grow into that nine position. For me, he's got a little bit of everything. He's got speed, agility. He's got the ability to get off quick distribution as well. He's the total package as far as I'm concerned. Probably the only area of weakness that he, I know that he needs to work on is his defense. But I think he'll get there with that as well. We've seen Caleb Clark for New Zealand turn around his defensive issues. So I'm sure Grant Williams can do it. So I'm really looking forward to watching Grant Williams go forward with this team. And I hope that he's going to get an opportunity to play for South Africa during their Northern Tour. Now talking about this Northern Tour for South Africa, there's going to be some interesting games coming up. They've got Scotland first at Murrayfield and then they're going to be playing England which is going to be played at Twickenham of course. Then they go to the Principality Stadium to play against Wales. Now this is going to be really interesting. Unfortunately we're not going to see that third test match against Ireland this year that everybody in the world of rugby is craving for between these two teams. But again, the powers to be don't give us fans what we want to see in the game of rugby. But I tell you what, we're going to see some great games and we're going to see Scotland, Wales and England do their very best to try and take down this South African team because there's nothing better for your own self-belief and motivation to beat the best rugby team in the world. And that's the label that South Africa are currently carrying. So what are we likely to see from Rassi during that Northern Tour when it comes to selections? Well, I think we're going to continue to see what we've already seen throughout the Rugby Championship. I think we're going to see a rotation of selections. I think we're going to see a number of players get opportunities, particularly against Scotland and Wales. And I think as they head into that game against England, we're going to see the best team, whatever that looks like at the time, rolled out against England. So it's going to be a really captivating Northern Tour as far as I'm concerned from the South African team. And it's going to be interesting how they start off and what selections Rassie's going to put forward against Scotland. I'll give that a go in a future video as we get closer and closer to those games. So watch out for that here on my channel. 
So overall, I thought it was a very good rugby championship from South Africa. They deserved the win. They had that little speed bump against Argentina in Argentina. But I tell you what, we have to give the credit to Argentina for that. They were able to beat the team that Rassi put out on the field on that particular day. So well done to Argentina. You know, a lot of players have stood out for me so far in the rugby championship for South Africa. And if I was to name just a few, it's a difficult task, but I'll give it a go. I'll say Oxen Chair has been brilliant throughout this rugby championship, but also ably supported by Bonami and also Franz Maherber. I think that front row for South Africa is a class of its own at the moment. Eben Etzebeth is playing as good a rugby as I've ever seen him play. He was outstanding, as was Ruan Norkia. So again, South Africa, very comprehensive in that forward department. And then, of course, Kalisi and Peter Steph de Toy were the others that stood out for me. I really liked what I saw from Mani Lebok in that last game against Argentina. And when he's got the freedom, both in his mind and in the game itself, he's able to put a fantastic game together. I'm sure Rassi's going to manage that emotionally with Manny Lebok as he moves forward. We've probably seen the last of Willie LaRue, I think, in a, in a constant basis at number 15, and I think Fassi is the future. And of course, we've got Damien Willemser coming back for South Africa. So there's a plethora of talent waiting to fill that 15 jersey for the Springboks. And of course, on the wings, they've got try scoring machines in Kirtley, Ardenser, and also Colby, um, Cheslin Colby, who I thought was another outstanding player in this year's rugby championship. So across the, the field, I thought the Springboks were really, really good in this rugby championship. I'm not saying the bounce of the ball is going South Africa's way at the moment. They're deserving these wins. But what I'm saying is the competition at the top of world rugby is very, very close. And we are going to see South Africa lose games. And we are going to see the All Blacks lose games. And we are going to see Ireland lose games. That's the nature of the era of rugby I think we're living in in world rugby today. This is what makes it so exciting as a fan. And while I'm singing, seeing this great performances from South Africa, I'm only happy to talk about it here on my channel, to embrace the brilliance they're bringing, to admire the coaching abilities of Rassi and the rest of his staff. And until we see them starting to get beaten on a regular basis, we should all enjoy it as rugby fans across the world. So yes, in fact, the South African Springboks are now world champions, double back-to-back -back world champions. They're Freedom Cup winners and they're also the 2024 Rugby Championship winners as well. A well-deserved accolade for the end of that particular part of their season. Now we get ready for the Northern Tours. It all ramps up again in a few weeks' time, and I'm going to be following it all here on Inside Rugby with Mark. So if you enjoyed my content today, and if you watch some of my other videos and you enjoy what this channel is all about, then why not hit the subscribe button and come along the journey with me. The many things I'm enjoying about doing this YouTube channel as a retired bloke is I get to engage with you a lot on the comments. And I can tell you now, if you take some time and thought into making your comments, then you're going to hear back from me and I'm going to put some thought into it as well. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you. In fact, I'm open to having a healthy debate on this channel. That's what it's all about. But if you can do that in a respectful manner, then it's always going to be appreciated here. If we're going to see those disrespectful comments, then that's not going to be stood for here on this channel, and I'll make amends to that straight away. Another thing that's come up recently is talking about referees. I don't do it on this channel. I don't want to turn this channel into a toxic place to talk about referees and abusing them online. That's not what I'm about. I love the game of rugby. I want us to talk about the beautiful things that are going on in the game. And if you want to be horrible to referees, go and do it somewhere else on another rugby channel. In fact, I don't want you to do it at all. But if you have to do it, this is not the place to do it. And I'll be deleting any comments that come along about talking about referees in an abusive manner. Okay, so there we go. Those are my thoughts around South Africa in the rugby championship this year. A deserved win in the rugby championship. Now we get super excited about the Northern Tours and all the things that are going on. We've got Argentina, New Zealand and South Africa touring the North this year. I will make sure I come back with plenty of videos talking about the lead up to all those games and of course doing my usual in-depth analysis of the games as and when they occur. So there's still plenty of things to talk about in the world of rugby. I hope you join me here on Inside Rugby with Mark. I really appreciate it.
Now it's time for me to go and get some tacos for breakfast and I wish you all a fantastic day out there in the rugby world. No matter where you are in the world, stay safe, stay well, keep enjoying your rugby. And until next time here on Inside Rugby with Mark, it's time to say adios from beautiful Cancun in Mexico. See you all again soon. Bye for now.